Hey, Jason here. Today's video, I'm going to analyze or answer the question, should you invest in investment education company InvestView, stock ticker INVU, INVU. This is an investment analysis for Keynes is a Clown on YouTube. Love the YouTube name, by the way. Before I get to that, though, I need to let you know you get this uh, video as a podcast anywhere in the world for free on all major podcasting platforms, Stitcher, Anchor, SoundCloud, um, Spotify, iTunes, and more. You get this as part of the I Invest in Your Car podcast anywhere in the world for free. And if you like this video and our videos, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know that any time we release a new video and release new videos all the time. Before we get to today's video, I apologize for this, but I have to do this because every time I forget to do it, I get nasty comments in the comments below. So here goes this uh, admittedly annoying spiel that I don't want to do. This uh, analysis is for educational purposes only. It is to help you learn how to spot red flags in companies faster and so you can spend more time evaluating uh, the good companies. This, in this, these analysis videos, you'll also learn uh, tips not only on how to spot red flags, but how to spot potentially good things. This is based off my preliminary analysis checklist, which you can get for free later, um, which I'll tell you about. Um, in the or it's in the description of this video, but I'll tell you more about it later. I do not short sell ever, so I don't make money when I talk negatively about a stock, and I do not own stock um, in a long position in any stock I talk positively about. I do not make money from this. This is to help you become <laughs> a better investor faster. Why should you listen to anything I have to say? In the first nine years of my career, I produce um, average investment returns per year in the portfolios I manage of 23.5% per year, every year for those nine years, not compounded. This puts me just behind the great Warren Buffett who produced 24.2% returns on average in the first nine years of his career and my returns legitimately make me one of the best stock pickers in the world. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to prove to you that I know what I'm talking about a little bit and to also prove to you that uh, maybe I'm someone you should listen to when it comes to investing or to learning about investing. Sorry about that. Okay, again, I apologize for that. I don't want to do it. I have to do it. Okay, so this is an investment analysis of InvestView, I-N-V-U. This is for Keynes is a clown. Every time I say that, I'm going to smile because I love the name. So let's get to the analysis. I purposely do not look at these stocks that I don't know anything about. Some of these stocks that um, I get re recommended from viewers, I know things about. Most companies I do not though because they're recommendations from viewers. Um, I purposely do not look at what the company does before I do the analysis because I don't want want it to bias me either positively or negatively. I don't care about the story at all until later. I don't care what it's planning to do. I don't care how it's planning to take over the world, to transform its industry, to disrupt its industry, to that its business might be declining, that its industry might be declining. I don't care about any of that until later. Um, this part of the analysis is the very first analysis I do, and unless a company surpasses my minimum thresholds, which we're going to talk about here, um, I don't look into the company further. That's the way I do things. It maximizes um, the amount of companies I can look at, and it gets rid of a lot of not great companies fast. So, InvestView Inc., I-N-V-U is the ticker. Um, first thing here is penny stock, which is to most people a bad thing. To me, it's not. I love tiny companies. Um, and this isn't even a super tiny company. It has a $1.03 billion market cap. So it's not even a super tiny company. I love companies. My favorite, absolute favorite companies are sub $500 million companies on the OTC or ADR list. <laughs> With a caveat. Unless you know what you're doing, do not invest in those kind of companies because 99% of them are terrible. Um, even though I love so-called penny stocks, so-called tiny companies, do not invest in this arena if you do not know what you're doing because, again, 99% of them are terrible. Um, and this comes from years of experience, probably researching over the years, 5,000 to 10,000 plus companies manually um, in this space. So, again, I love these companies or these kind of companies. Do not invest in them if you don't know what you're doing. 
Okay. You pay a big dividend. I wonder if that's a special dividend because most tiny companies, again, tiny, this is small, it's not tiny. Um, most smaller companies do not pay any dividend, let it alone a 5.1% dividend. So that's interesting. Um, this shows me right here that consensus forward PE is has no number, that they're unprofitable. This price sales number, I don't care about price of sales, but at 41, that is one sign the company might be gigantically overvalued, especially when you consider that it's unprofitable over here on the PE basis. We'll figure that out as we go further though. Okay, invest View Inc. provides research, education, and investment tools designed to assist the self-directed investor in successfully navigating the financial markets. Services include research trade alerts and live trading rooms that consist of instruction in equities, options, forex, ETFs, binary options, crowdfunding, and cryptocurrency mining services and sector education. The firm also provides education and software applications to assist individual in debt reduction, increased savings, budgeting, and proper tax management. So, first off, I love investor education. I'm completely self-taught, which means my investments are self-directed and the portfolios I manage, I manage those portfolios as a self-directed, self-taught investor. So I love investor education, love financial financial literacy. It's one of my passions. Um, I want to help bring financial education and investing education to the world because we need it. Um, <laughs> you're, you're not taught this in middle school, high school, college for the most part. Um, and it's insanely valuable. And again, I'll probably have another video at that at some point because I don't want to get off on a tangent here uh, and talk because I could talk for 30, 40 minutes just about that, probably even longer. Okay, so this is not a tiny company in terms of size. It is a tiny company in terms of revenue. They grew from $2 million in revenue in 2011 to $26 million in the last 12 months. Um, and I opened their website to see. So they are an education company. And interesting, they do that through the blockchain, which personally, I love the blockchain. I'm completely fascinated by things like uh, the blockchain, DeFi, space. Um, personally, on a personal level, I'm fascinated by all this stuff. Um, and I, so that's interesting to me. Perpetual. That is very interesting. So the reason I brought this up is because I have heard this company's name before, but I couldn't quite place where it was. So normally I wouldn't even bring the company's site up until later, until we came across a reason. I didn't look at the site other than just take a quick glance before this video. Um, but I couldn't quite place where the company, where I heard the company's name from before. And I think this is it, um, Bitcoin mining. They do a lot of Bitcoin mining. Um, but, future potential reverse, okay, that's interesting. Um, so that's probably where I've heard them from. This is interesting and scary is what this is, um, but this, this is most likely where I've heard their name from. Um, ah, that's where it is. OTC. So <laughs> that's where I was like, I can't play. I can't because I don't I don't invest personally in Bitcoin. Um, so I, that's I must have. I thought maybe I'd seen where they came from. This is where I've seen them from. I've actually um, probably about two years ago now, because every couple of years I go through the entire OTC market list um, database of like 25,000 companies and I download it and go through the companies manually. So that's where I must have seen that the INVU and the InvestView ticker before is because I've done that and this is how I know this, the OTC QB um, for all company news. That's the OTC markets. So yeah, I have evaluated this company um, by downloading the entire database of OTC companies. And again, I go through these manually. I show you, I'll show you guys that in another video. Um, but that's where that, where this company name sounds familiar from. Okay. So I have evaluated this company. Frankly, I don't remember what it was because that was probably two plus years ago that I did that. Um, we'll come back to these things later. 
Let's keep going with the numbers for now. Uh, negative operating income, negative net income. I look for 10% positive on a consistent basis for operating income, and this company is way away from that um, in terms of margins, in terms of absolute profits. Um, in dollar amounts, it's not because it's a small company. This is a gigantic issue. 2 million shares, they went from 2 million shares in 2011 to 3.21 billion, billion, not million, 3.21 billion shares in the trailing 12 month period. Share dilution is bad for all companies. It's catastrophic or potentially catastrophic for tiny companies. Why? Let me show you. Let's see if it shows. I can almost guarantee just from the share dilution that this company's shares have cratered. And they have. So how did I know that? How did I know just from the share dilution that their shares have likely cratered? Because that's what happens when you over dilute your shares. <laughs> this is like inflation. Um, the more, and I've talked about this in several videos, so I'm only going to kind of hit the highlights here. Uh, the more you dilute shares, the more earnings and profits per sh and cash flows per share spread out. So let's say the company has 1 million shares and they go to 10 million shares. That means automatically your shares are worth, um, or your, the, your, the value per share is 10 X less than it was when you had 1 million shares because they're now 9 million other shareholders. Actually, it's probably 9x. Uh, that's how I knew just from looking at the share dilution that this company was likely massively diluted or that the share price has cratered, and it has. So back in 2000, this company, that's, that's probably not a fair comparison. That was during the tech bubble. So let's go to um, November 30th, 2001. They had a share price of um, over $1,100 per share. Now their share price is 33 cents per share. If you say that's not a fair comparison, let's go over the last decade. So over the last 20 years, the company's lost 99.96% of its value. In the last 10 years, the company's lost 94.5% of its um, share price due to dilution. Um, this, again, it's bad. Share dilution is bad for big companies. It's potentially catastrophic for tiny companies. This is why. Because if you keep diluting shareholders over and over and over again just to stay alive, you crush the value per share of the company, which drastically lowers the value of the company shares. Because over the long term, companies are valued based on the cash flows they produce. And if cash flow per share goes down, and that's what happens when you dilute shareholders, the value of the shares go down. That's how I knew just by looking at that one number that it was almost certain that the company share price was down drastically. This, again horrifically bad but this is how the company is staying alive it's doing this it's likely my guess would be it's transitioned especially from 2017 to 2018 because it issued uh, went from 33 million shares in 2017 to 1.912 billion shares in 2018 i'm guessing they went through some kind of major transition um during that time probably to the bitcoin stuff and blockchain stuff but they aren't any profits they aren't, let's see if they're earning cash flows from all this share. They're still negative on the cash flow um, basis, even after all the share dilution, because their revenue is not growing enough um, and their profits are still negative. That can be seen here. Their cost of goods sold is way down, but their selling general administrative costs are gigantic. What is that? That's a good question. <laughs> In most cases, this is like um, 
this is like salaries and stuff like that. In this case, it might be um, compensation from an IPO. I'm, I'm not really sure, frankly, until I go into their financials, which I'm not going to do. I can tell already I wouldn't invest in this company from just from these few things. Because again, I invest a lot in this arena, smaller company arena, and shared dilution is an absolute killer, especially if the company doesn't use that capital well to start generating profits and cash flows. However, having said that, let's keep going through the analysis. Not much to say up here, frankly, other than the share count, because there's not much to report on up there. This is what happens in this other category down here, cost of goods sold, or this other category down here in terms of the cost, the other category is another huge reason why they're unprofitable. I wouldn't want to know what these costs are. To find that out, I'd have to go into their financials. ROIC is not even showing up. I look for anything on above 10% on a consistent basis. Free cash flow to sales is still hugely negative. Um, it's not as negative in the recent years. Uh, due to the share dilution, but because they're unprofitable on an operating basis, and they're still wildly, again, in a percentage basis, wildly outspending their costs, not an absolute dollar basis. That's why they're prof uh, unprofitable on a free cash flow basis, even though they've issued a ton of shares just to stay alive and to keep the business operating. Cash levels are actually kind of pretty low. I expect those to be higher. Um, at 10.3%, I expect them to be higher based on based on their share dilution. Their PP&E is huge too, 55.3%. That's odd for an information company. I would want to know what that is specifically. They have a huge amount of debt too. So 139.9% of their entire balance sheet is long-term debt. And in total, they have negative 120%, negative 120.9% in negative shareholder equity and their total liabilities make up 221% rounded up of their balance sheet. What that means is that after subtracting total asset, normally you, what you do is you subtract total assets from total liabilities and you get a positive number left over there and it's called book value or shareholders equity. In this case, total liabilities far outweigh total assets, which means the company has negative book value or negative shareholders equity. What does that mean? That after subtracting liabilities, that just based on the balance sheet, the company has negative equity value. Equity is the shares you buy. And so in other words, this means the shares you buy on the market right now are worth less than zero. Worth less than zero. Reiterate that. Worth less than zero. Is that an, always an apples to apples comparison? No, it's not. Uh, because companies have operations and the balance sheet doesn't include the operational value of the company. However, this company's operations are negative or are, are unprofitable. So unless they have some valuable IP or something, this company is worth less than zero according to both the operational value. And, and again, this is over the long term. They haven't earned a profit, um, what, ever? In the last 10 years at least. They haven't earned a profit on operating basis. On a net income basis, they earned a small profit in 2017, and on a free cash flow basis, they've been unprofitable for the entire decade. They do not have a cash conversion cycle because I'm assuming they're software or um, online based, which is again confusing with the PP&E, unless that's like um, uh, mining, Bitcoin mining stuff, maybe. Again, we'd have to find out. We might find out here. Okay, low cash levels, 260 million in cash. No, that's total. Uh, 1.1 billion in cash, which is actually a lot because their market cap is 1 point something billion. But we're gonna keep going down here. So they have a ton of furniture, fixtures, and office equipment. Bitcoin mining stuff, maybe? I hope. Something. Hope that's not just furniture. 
Uh, they have a decent amount of IP. But we're getting to the bad stuff now. That's all good stuff. Current debt. So they have a ton of current debt. They have 3.4 billion in current debt. Plus they have, ooh, 15.1 billion in long-term debt and capital leases. Wow. Um, <laughs> that is significant. Um, I'm not even going to go in a retainer and he's going to accumulate a deficit. I've actually, I will, because that's a gigantic number. Oh, and these are in millions. <laughs> okay. So these numbers are a little bit better. That's why you need to be careful with this, but still their debt load is way higher than their, um, than their cash levels. Still not great, or it's not as bad as I originally thought, but it's still not great. Um, and for that reason, I'm not going to talk about the return to earnings accumulated deficit either. Okay. Because they are unprofitable, I'm assuming most of their valuation metrics are going to be negative or unreadable. It is correct. So if the PE, it's interesting that that's 0.35. They're unprofitable on a net profit basis. And they have been for the last decade, so I don't know why that's positive. Um, same thing on the cash flow. I don't know why that has a number at all. And their enterprise value to EBIT is negative, which is useless because the company is unprofitable. So let's go back over here quickly. Why did I say... Okay, this is interesting. This is a potentially good thing for the company to do a reverse uh, split and to uplist onto like the probably, yeah, NASDAQ. Um, that's a good thing for tiny companies to do most of the time because it gives them greater exposure. More people can buy them. A lot of people can't buy OTC stocks um, either legally because they can't, like most banks can't. Um, and a lot of big companies can't either because they will move the needle. One, one billion dollar company for a 300 million billion dollar company, for example, not gonna move the needle much. Okay, so they're more of a financial tech company now, which I kind of got. Bitcoin mining and digital assets, okay. So they're transitioning, fair enough. The problem here, where was that? Preferred perpetual, that means forever, perpetual preferred offering. So let's see, 13, what was it? 13%, where was that? So just to stay alive, here it is. They're trying to raise $50 million and they're gonna pay a 13% interest rate on preferred stock. That's absurd. Um, you never see interest rates that high Frankly, I, don't, I can't. The last time you saw interest rates this high were in the 70s, 80s, or the stag inflation era. Stag inflation era. The only time you see interest rates this high right now, because interest rates, even though they're rising pretty substantially from 0.55% to something like around 1.7% um, right now, this is 13%. So the only reason you see this interest rate is so high is because they can't because <laughs> they can't raise money anywhere else, most likely. And because they are such high risk, that's why the interest rate is so high. The more risk in general, the more risk people see in something, the higher the interest rate they require for that investment. That's scary. And this is a perpetual preferred, meaning they will have to pay this forever until they pay it off or until they pay this amount back or whatever the agreement is based on based on the based on the um what the word i'm searching for the the offering doc whatever the offering doc says whatever the kind of agreement is until that is paid off or again you probably see it right here and you could yeah the s1 that's what i was looking for out of curiosity, I'll probably read this at some point, but that will fall outside the scope of this. 
Uh, I actually might make a video on that depending on how, in how interesting that is. But the main point is here that there's no way this isn't a high risk investment with a 13% yield. There's no way. If, if this was a lower risk investment, they would be able to pay, let's say five, six, 7% on this preferred. That's what kind of lower risk, smaller risk companies pay on preferreds. Most companies don't pay, use preferreds at all anymore. But if they do, they're three, four, five, six, seven percent. I can't ever say I've seen one at 13% ever. And I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, I've evaluated to some degree, probably more than 10,000 companies worldwide. Uh, I can't say I've ever seen a yield at 13% unless I was studying something back in the stagflation area of the 1970s, 1980s. That's an absurdly high rate. And again, I don't think I've ever seen a perp perpetual preferred offering bond, except um, like when you're reading about stock market bubbles and stuff like that back in the 20s, uh, maybe not the 20s and 30s, but just various stock market bubbles. You will occasionally see these perpetual kind of bonds offerings or a semi bond offering with the preferred, preferred stock. Um, usually it doesn't end well, pretty much never ends well, actually. Um, this company is scary. This was a great case study. Keynes is a clown. Great case study. Uh, scary company though. There's no way I'd invest in this company. I don't care. Again, this is why I don't invest in the story because just from these risks that I've talked about, the risks are enormous here. One of the, this is just based on this preliminary numbers. This is one of the riskiest companies I've ever seen. Uh, based on these preliminary numbers. And I've evaluated some doozies that are pretty bad. This is probably top three of the most risky companies I've ever evaluated. Again, over thousands, tens, more than 10,000 companies I've ever evaluated to some degree. This is up there, probably top three. I would not recommend investing in this company under really any circumstance, even in the bonds or even in the preferred stock. Because um, I, <laughs> with an interest rate being at 13%, um, that means the company is, or that the investor is doing that, that the S1, that there's an enormous amount of risk and the company has a high likelihood of not paying those preferreds back. So I wouldn't even invest in the preferreds um, with that high dividend yield. So, because they're not profitable, they're diluting shareholders, they're issuing 13% yield preferred stock, which is all of this is, is crazy. So I hope this helped. Again, great case study here. Keynes is a clown. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Love to hear everybody else's thoughts on this. Um, if I miss something, if I didn't explain something well enough, if I should explain something better, let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, make a like, love, share, subscribe, and comment, and hit the notification bell so you're notified anytime we release a new video and release new videos all the time. Let me bring my face back here so I'm not just talking to myself. not working still there we go struggling if you're listening on the podcast make sure to do all that same stuff um but we also really appreciate a review the more reviews views and listens we get with our content the more people we can help if you're looking for um more help on to become a better investor faster make sure to check out our resources below you can get our five free gifts which you can get the full preliminary analysis template um as part of the written template for free as part of those five free gifts, you can also get a PDF copy of my book, How to Value Invest. You also get a copy of my guide, um, Seven Tips to Picking Great Stocks, Three Times You Must Sell. You can get all three of those for free at the links below. If you're looking for more specific help from me, make sure to check out the information on our masterclass also below. But until next time, have a great day. Talk soon. Bye.